he says, I was born again when I was 12 years old. I said, awesome, tell me what happened. You know, so he shared his story. And now he's probably a little older than I am, and he's lived life. And as we continue to talk, we talk about um, who God is. And you know, sometimes when you meet people that need me to talk to a pastor, they want to talk all spiritual stuff. And that's okay, I like to listen and, and see where he comes. But at, at the end of, towards the end of the conversation, he started telling me how there's a God uh, of everything. Like God is everywhere and everything. And, uh, and I listened a little bit longer, and the Holy Spirit told me, go ahead. You know, I got the okay from the Holy Spirit. And I said, uh, that's not true. God's not in the frogs or trees or the sun and the moon. I mean, even though those things can bring us to him, they're not gods. And there's God, the God of the Koran, and the God of this and the God of that. It's all the same. And I had to say, no, it's not all the same. It's not all the same. God, the creator of this world, amen, the one who loved us and said, I'm going to send my son to die for you, that's the God that we serve. Amen. The one that spoke into existence, the earth and the moon and the plants and the fish and the birds, separated by his spirit, the heavens, and now we have night and day, that God is God we serve. Amen. The, the God that said, as the children of Israel were coming out and gave Moses these commandments, said, this God, I'm a jealous God, and don't have any other God before me. Don't make any graven images. Don't worship the, the nature. Don't worship the trees or the plants that I've created. You worship me. That's the God that we serve. Amen? And our conversation ended quickly. But I thought to myself, I have to tell the truth. I didn't want to compromise truth for relationship. I wanted to know him. I wanted to befriend him. I wanted to hopefully share with him more about Jesus and his relationship with God. Since he was 12 years old, he accepted Jesus. But obviously the conversation ended because I told him the truth that he didn't accept that. See, in, the, in this in this age of inclusiveness, there is a light that shines brighter than all the other lights. Amen? There is a truth that happens that will bring, et bring us to eternity. There's, a, there's something that's greater than the things that we create in our minds and our intelligence. His name is God, our Heavenly Father who put us together in our mother's womb, who knew all the days of your life and knows what we're going through. That God has got to be served. And even though at times we may stumble and fall, his love for us never changed. Even for the children of Israel. Go back and read the story. Yeah, he was a little upset with them. He told Moses, I'm going to wipe them off the face of the earth because of the way they're, they're rebellion. But no, he never would have. Just like a father gets mad at a child. We're not going to kill our children, right, dads? We love them. We don't understand what they do sometimes or how they think. We forget how we were when we were teenagers, all of a sudden, when we were older. But we still love them. And God loved us so much that he sent Jesus to fulfill that, that sacrificial lamb for you and me, so our sins can be forgiven. That's the God we serve today. I want to, let's look at the character of God just a little bit. I want to look at Deuteronomy chapter 5. And this is the Ten Commandments. We're just going to go through them really quick. i got a lot of things I want to tell you today. And i got some scriptures. We're going to be in Deuteronomy 5, Ephesians 5, and Acts 4. And then I'm going to end with the Holy Spirit. So you got four different points. Um, and then I'll finish, but um, look at God, and, and let's just go right to verse 6. And he said, and he's talking to the children of Israel. Now remember, he's talking to the children of Israel. Now how many believers do I have here today? I believe in God the Father. 
All right? And if you are believers of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, then you know that when you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we were grafted now into the vine, right? Which is the children of Israel. Now we're children of God, just like the children of Israel. We are now, we have the same inheritance. We have the same blessings. Amen? Come on. And we are together. We're not separate. The church of God is not separated from the children of Israel. Come on. We know it is. We're, we're part of that. So when we're praying for Israel, when we say pray for the peace of Israel, we're praying for the peace of the church. Uh, we're playing, praying for the peace of, uh, of the believers, if you will. Or we're, we use the word like in Antioch, they call Christians. So we're praying for the peace of the Christians. All right? We're all one in God's eyes. That's why John 17 is so important. I pray for those that will believe in the message. Amen? He prayed for everybody, that we be in unity, that the world may know that Jesus is the Son of God. That's what John 17 says. That we are unified, and through our unity, people come to know God. Amen? Know Jesus and know salvation. So look at uh, verse 6. It says, I am God, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Now we can look at this spiritualize it. I am the God who brought you out of your sin. We know Egypt represents our old life, right? And so we know he's our God. He brings us out of our old life, out of Egypt, and he brings us to a new place, amen? Um, out of slavery, we're a slave to our sin. You shall have no other God, and look at the, in my Bible, it has a little g. No other God before me. What does that mean? Nothing. The, look at the Hebrew word. It's nothing. No, uh, no affection towards anything else but towards God himself. No desire, but desire him. Wow. Nothing before him. So husbands and wives, and we'll go into Ephesians a little bit, as you love God, and that example will be how I love my wife and my children and how I lead them. Amen. I'll get into that just a little bit later. But it says, we have nothing else before. We have nothing. Nothing. So, wow. You know, so I was explaining a few weeks ago about missional community. How many remember that? We all have a mission and we live in a community. We can create a missional community by getting a group of people to help us reach our lost neighbors and loved ones for Jesus. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more as we go through this year, because I want to see us really touching people for Jesus. So our Capital City Church is a multicultural, multi-ethical church that's reaching our community and world for Christ, and we have to start doing that, because that's who we are, amen? And we want to see other people come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. So we need to... Uh, um, I don't know where I was going with that, so is that okay? Uh, but anyway, we need to be uh, have no other God before us. Oh, that's what I was say, because your job, your job, this is a, a new thinking for me too. Your job is given to you by God. Come on, he knows everything about you. He knit you together in your mother's room. He knows all the days of your life. So he knows you. So your employment, your education, everything you're doing is so you can do the mission of winning lost people to Jesus. So now God has financed your ministry through your work. So you don't have to come to church to get a paycheck. You can just do your work for God because he's provided for you. How many ever, is that a little different thinking? We pay the pastor, we give him a salary so he can do, win the loss for Jesus, right? But it's not just my responsibility, it's all of our responsibilities. So you have a job that God's given you so not only will you raise your family and, and love people and all that, but so you can bring them to a, a saving knowledge of Jesus. So you think about it this way. I, every time you get that paycheck now, you can say, oh, God just financed my ministry. So now sitting in my house and watching the TV all day long, I need to get out and talk to people because I know God's going to give us some divine appointments, some people that I can share his love with, and I'm going to see them come to know Jesus. You know what? A revolution, it will change your life. It will change your whole thinking when you start giving 
out to people and, and sharing God's love with them and all of a sudden realizing that my whole existence on earth is that to glorify Jesus and to see the lost come to him. It changed. I want to change your thinking. It's a paradigm shift because I, I really don't like, I, I, may, I used to love Sunday morning. I can't get, wait to get up. I still can't wait to get up on Sunday morning. But I think I, uh, the church model does a disservice to you because now all the responsibility or all we look forward to is this day. We'll get some more worship team people. We'll have a great worship team. And we'll just, you know, we'll dance and we'll have fun. That's great. And I want to have this. I think we should celebrate together on Sunday morning and worship God and thank Him for what He's done. And be encouraged in the Word of God. But I want to see you guys just illuminate your walk with Christ in the world. Just be light. That the world will come. And you can lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Amen? And God will give you a word of knowledge for somebody at your work. Amen? All those gifts in 1 Corinthians is for us to operate every day. And not just for Sunday morning. How many believe that? I'm way off my topic, but that's okay. I was trying to tell you, you have the power in you. You have the Holy Spirit in you. So the Holy Spirit is the giver of the gifts, right? Have you read that? Go back and read 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The Holy Spirit gives those gifts as He wills to you and me. So I'm, I'm walking through the grocery store, and I'll, I get a word of knowledge for the person in front of me. Now I can do two things. I can shut up and not say anything, or I can actually do something. Might even get embarrassed a little bit, because I've never done it before. But I know the Holy Spirit is telling me to talk to that person. And all you have to do is say, how are you doing? And they'll throw up on you. They'll tell you everything about their lives. They'll tell you all their situations and all their issues. It just amazes me. I remember we were in a store at the hardware store with Rajiv, and we're picking some stuff up from my bathroom. We're working on our, uh, my, my bathroom, and the gentleman was, uh, had surgery on his knee. He's telling us, he told us every detail about his life and his problem. So we prayed for them right there in the middle of the hardware store. Amen? Come on, God wants us to do that. That's what Jesus did. He went around walking and talking and, and just, you've heard this last week, didn't you? I can't wait till we get on fire like that. Pastor, look, at I, I led this person to the Lord at, at, at Lowell's. I, I, I went to the cops, and this is the verse I, I read, brought to Jesus for cops. I was at work, and this is my, my, my uh, what do you call him, cube mate. I led him to Jesus. This person was going through divorce, but I talked to them and shared God with them, and, and now they're staying married. Hallelujah! This one had the child was sick with disease, and, and, and I went over to their house because I just felt like the Spirit told me to go visit them, and I went to visit them. I laid hands on that little girl, and God healed them. Come on, I get goosebumps. The power of God is in you. Why? Because not of your righteousness or anything you've done. It's because of the Spirit of God in you. Because when you and I said yes to Jesus, and I remember that day for me was February 23rd, 1980. I remember that day. It was a deposit in me. Something deposited. Something changed in me. And the Spirit of God entered. Sin left and the, the Spirit of God now has residence in me. Because now our bodies are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. Come on. So when you're out there, and you've got to say no to the Holy Spirit all the time because He's always talking to you. He, when you're reading the Word of God, He's illuminating the Word of God to you. When you're out in a public place, He's leading you right to truth. He's telling you, that's not true. That, when that gentleman told me that, I said to him, I could say, oh yeah, that's okay. I, yeah, I understand where you're coming from. No, I said, because the Holy Spirit told me because I would have probably messed it up. All I said is, no, that's not true. And the atmosphere changed instantly because now he was confronted with truth. And he was backing away. He was like, okay, okay. You know, he was ready. He wanted to leave. But he couldn't because it was just a small area. He couldn't run away. It was awesome. I'd love to see that. Struggling with truth because all his life, since he was 12, he said he was a believer. All right? So he went through elementary school, high school. He's an educated man. I'm sure he went to college somewhere. I didn't ask him that. And now all the philosophies of the world that had poured in his head and into his body and into his spirit, and now he, has to, now he was confronted that morning because of the wedding with truth. And he ran. 
I, mean, I feel sorry for him. I want him to know that God is this guy that we're talking about. Amen? It says, look at verse 11, or verse 8. It says, you shall not make for yourself any idols in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, is a jealous God, punishing the children. Now listen to this. For the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. But showing love. Come on, this is God. He doesn't want to show hatred. He wants to show love. That's why it says it right next here. It says, but showing love. For a thousand generations, those who love me and keep my commandments. So all my children's 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 children, thousand generations, said forever. Amen. So I, I like angels smiling. I know, brother. God, for a thousand generations, God, you have now changed your whole family line because of your love for God. Amen. These, I will, I wait. For a thousand generations, those that love God. Amen. Praise the Lord. And anyone in that other category can change in a minute as long as they believe in God. Amen. They can change. You don't have to hate God all your life. But they'll be changed, and God will change their whole family line. Uh, my family. Now, it's hard. Um, my children and my grandchildren now, I know, will love God. And now my, my brothers and sisters are having a hard time right now. Right? They, my, my, my siblings, because none of them are really believers. They're coming really, really close, though. Because my sister was dead on that hospital uh, uh, bed, you know, she had two map, two flat line events in her in, in, at the hospital, and we went in there and I prayed for her, and I said, God, bring life back to this this body, and God did. And I went and saw her on, on, third, on Tuesday. I saw her, and she just was grinning from ear to ear because she know God touched her, and I reminded her, God loves you and wants something greater for you. That's why he spared your life. And, and he, I just said, God bless. I just went over the whole situation of what happened, how we prayed for her. And she just beamed, right? And then I had to leave and I came back. And I was leaving again because I got some flowers from her for my, for, to transplant to my house. And uh, she goes, aren't you going to pray for me before you leave? I'm like, oh yes, I am. <laughs> Come. And we prayed and spoke life into her again. Amen. And now she's an example because my sister just has this way with all the uh, all her young, all her nieces and nephews. She just has a uh, way with her. They love her, and she just can communicate to them. And now she can communicate this truth about who God really is. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's give them praise this morning. Amen. All right. I misuse the Lord's God. Don't be cussing. Don't be using the Lord's name in vain. Don't be don't be doing that. The world does that. If you're a believer, don't do that. Okay? Enough said? Amen. <laughs> it says, observe the Sabbath day and make it holy. Now, this is an argument between the, the Jewish believers and the, the church. Do we celebrate the Sabbath on Sunday, or do we celebrate the Sabbath on, on Friday nights? Whatever you want to do it, just do it. All right? There's nothing wrong with it. It's not a separation because when you come together on a Sabbath, like a uh, Shabbat or whatever on a Friday night, you're, you're glorifying God. If you come together on Sunday morning, you're glorifying God. Is that okay? Good. There's unity in the body of Christ. Amen. There's not, it's not a right or wrong because we're worshiping God. Is that okay? Pastor, how do you believe? What should we do? Sunday or Friday? Do a bow. Do whatever. Because do it on Saturday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Just do it every day of the week. Just honor Him. All right? Quit, quit putting separation between us and a Jewish believer. It shouldn't be that way. Why? Because those Jewish believers believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Right? And us Gentiles, we believe the same thing. And so when they, on Wednesday, on September 16th, when the Apostolic Prayer Network comes here, and they have shofars, and they have flags, and they have banners, it's a Wednesday night, you, need, you can't miss this one. They're going to do more of a, a Jewish-flavored worship. It's okay. All right? 
And if you go to a place where they have guitars and drums and they're worshiping and dancing, that's okay. Or if you come here and we have Tina playing the piano, it's okay. Because we love Jesus. Amen. Amen? This is what's going to happen in the world very, very soon. That the believers are going to come together like Jesus prayed for us. So that he can be glorified. Amen? I don't see too many confused faces out there, so that's good. Because it's not confusing. Well, Paul said all we have to do is not drink blood and not eat things that sacrifice to idols and so on and so on. That's, that's right. We're still there. They teach the Gentiles all the Don't teach them all the law. Jesus fulfilled the law. So I say, what, is, what are we supposed to believe? What, what are the commandments that we're supposed to obey? These ten? The two that Jesus gave us? The whole 600 and whatever, 49 of them, is that, is that right? Uh, maybe I got the number wrong. Laws that are in the Bible? Do I do obey those? What do I obey? I like what Jesus said. I kind of default to him. He says, love God. It's cool because he didn't end there. He said, love God with everything. Your heart, all of it. Your mind, every bit of it. Your strength, every part of you. Love him. All right, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do the best I can to love God and put him first in everything in my life. Amen? And then he said this, I love the wisdom of our God. The character, our, he said he didn't exclude anybody in the word of God. From Genesis to Revelation, everybody, every people group, everybody was included since the beginning of time. And he says this, love your neighbor as yourself. Powerful. Powerful. I remember it's about two years ago I, I preached a sermon called God isn't racist, we are. You remember that, some of you? Huh? We judge automatically. We, are, we have a problem and struggle with these areas in our life, but we should because the Bible says this. Not only that we love our brothers and sisters in Christ that like we, we associate with and fellowship with, but we should love everybody else too. So, um, I won't get into that story. But anyway, love everybody. Okay? Does that make sense? Amen. Pastor said today, love God and love everyone else. How does that happen? You have to love them. That means you have to actually act like you love somebody that you might not like. Because they're different. Or they speak different. Or they dress different. Or they have a, a problem with certain sin. Jesus walked through the earth loving people, healed the woman at the well, all sorts of issues in her life. Come on. And the husband you're living with is not even your husband. Or the man you're living with is not even your husband. He knew all of that. Zacchaeus ripped off everybody. He was a thief. God went to his house. Just being in his presence, showing kindness, going to his house to have a meal, he repented and gave back four times what he stole. Not just what he stole, but four times. He repented that day. I believe that day Jesus became a believer in Jesus Christ. The lepers. The Samaritans. Now look at that. Think about that. Jesus was at the well with a woman that was half Jew, half Samaritan, which in the Bible says that they consider those people dogs. They wouldn't even talk to them. If they saw them walking down the street, they'd walk across the street. They wouldn't want to be near them. Jesus walks up and just talks to her. And what you're thirsting for is not going to come from this water. And what you're looking for is eternal life. Don't worry about if I should worship. I don't think about it. She's, read that story. It's amazing. Should I worship at this mountain or this mountain? Should I worship as, it basically says, should I worship, worship as the Jews worship, or should I worship in the temple of the Samaritans? That's what she was saying. He said, neither. You worship me. As I have to give eternal life. Hallelujah. Come on, don't get excited about me. Come on, this is, this is good stuff. Right? Build up the faith. 
All right, and go on. So then we have the, the Sabbath day. Then we have honor your mother and father. Come on. How many uh, adults here still need to work on honoring your mother and father? Don't raise your hands. All right, God already knows. This is the area I had to work on. I want my kids to honor. I tell my kids, honor me. Because in Ephesians it says, if you honor me and your mother, you'll live a long life. Right? The only, the only command would promise. I asked my kids. They knew it when they, they, as soon as they came out of the, uh, uh, came uh, home from the hospital, I spoke that over them. Right? Every time they did something wrong, I told them that this is the verse. Right? You, you want to live long? You got to honor mom and dad. We know what we're doing. Sort of. All right? Honor your mom and dad. I think a lot of adults need to do that. Right? And we did the same thing. We, Tina and I had to both examine how our relationship with our mom and dad were. And even though there's some things that we didn't like that happened when we grew up, we honored them anyway. We call them regularly because we, we, we live away from Wisconsin. We call them and we spend time with them. And now we can spend time with them now just because we want to honor them as our mom and dad. So our children will see that's the right thing to do. Even though they might be whatever. It doesn't matter how grumpy they can be or how we don't believe the way they believe or whatever. It doesn't really matter. We're going to honor them as my dad. So my dad, who doesn't believe the way I do, I uh, actually had him up here on the stage with me. We talked about our relationship, but we got saved. And so my, my, my dad, you, some of you were here for that. My dad and my son Chris and myself and my other son uh, who was in Indiana, we Skyped in and we had him on. And we all shared how we got saved and how we served Jesus. So my brothers, what was so beautiful about it, my family, that it was like this argument. Do you believe the way dad believes or do you believe the way Bob believes? And so was, my family was confused. I said, I'm not going to have no more confusion. I'm going to love my dad so they understand that when unity, Jesus is the most important part. It's not about what dad believes or what I believe. It's about Jesus. And it worked. Amen? And it worked. My family's coming closer and closer to Jesus because of that. Amen? All right, this one. Uh, don't murder. Okay, is that okay? That's a good one. Don't kill anybody. All right? Don't commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. I like this. I, I could talk hours for that one. Just quit gossiping. Quit talking about people. Quit talking about your coworkers. Quit talking about your boss. Quit talking about your friends. Quit talking about the church. Quit talking about somebody unless you can tell you something good. My mom used to say, if you can't say nothing good, don't say it at all. I believe it's true. She got away from here. All right? Why? Because it, our tongue has power. And we can bring life to people or we can bring death to people by what we say. And so we need to watch what we say. I mean, even we talk to each other, right? When we say things and we start, start, start grumbling a little bit because we all start grumbling, we, we say we have this permission. Me and my wife have this permission. You know, cut me off or I cut her off and we get to that point where we get too grumpy about stuff, right? Why? Because we're going to speak life into every situation, not death. Is that good? You write that down and put that on your forehead too. That's a good word right there. So be careful what you say. False testimonies. And do not covet your neighbor's stuff or your neighbor's wife. You shall not set your desires on your neighbor's house, land, merchandise, or manservants, maidservants. Anything that your neighbor has, quit, quit lusting after other stuff. I think that we as believers, rich or poor, wherever, God, wherever you wind up on the scale of economy, right? Whatever, wherever you go. Just thank God. Be grateful. Be, if God said he'd give you all that you need. All that you need. And we always want more. I want a boat. I almost have to be careful about that, you know. A lot of people have boats that aren't using them. I could just go fishing with them. That's fine. So I really don't need that, right? But I still go on Craigslist and look at it almost every night. All right. <laughs> Don't, maybe, maybe you should say this, maybe the commandment should be, be content with what you have. Maybe that's what we should have. So if you have nice things, great. If you need things, get them. God doesn't want us to, if you have the means to do, do, do. Don't, that's okay. But honor God with all of that. Because everything you have is His. Because He gave you the ability to have the knowledge and wisdom that you have. Amen? Amen. Okay, that was point one. I'm serious. I'm gonna I'm gonna do this over the next three weeks probably. Love God with all 
your being in every part of your flesh. The second part of the, the second message was Ephesians 5, that we are the bride of Christ. So I won't go into that too much. But you are the bride. And I'll talk about this next week in a little more detail. And the next, the last one, let's turn there to Acts 4.12. And I'll, I'll close with this. You know when a preacher says that, it really doesn't mean anything. So, Peter and John are heading to the temple. This man, legs, strength came to his legs. He jumped up and he began to thank God, worshiping Peter and John. And then the Sanhedrin, the religious folks, got really ticked off. Because now they're praying in the name of Jesus, the one that they wanted to silence. And they didn't want to hear this person's name anymore. They crucified him, turned him over to the Roman soldiers so they would, this sect, this, this group of people would be scattered, but it didn't. It empowered them because now they have the Spirit of God in them. And then he begins to explain that to them. And then in verse 12, this verse is, is etched in my heart. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to man by which you must be saved. So go back to the wedding. I'm going to the wedding and I'm in Ephesians. I'm sharing, we'll turn, just turn to Ephesians real quick. I'm in Ephesians. I'm sharing with this young couple just a five minute little, uh, little, little explaining, explaining to them a little bit about what it means to be married in the eyes of God. And I use the verse that most ladies hate, most men abuse. In verse 22, Ephesians 5, 20 says, Wives, submit, your, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is head of the house, or head of the church, his body, of which he is Savior. And then it goes on, and you can read the whole thing. I won't, I'll explain this next week. But I was explaining to the young man how... God gave himself for the church. And you're supposed to love, and it says about six times, that the husband is to love the wife. And then why is that? Because men need to be reminded that our job is to love our wives. We just have, we're selfish in nature, and we're self-seeking, and that's just the way we are. And so we need to be reminded, and God here, uh, through the Holy Spirit, many times said, the husband, love your wife, love your wife, love your wife. And then I told the young lady, I said, and, and here it says you're supposed to respect your husband. But it comes natural. Because when a woman is loved, come on ladies, you're going to respect that man. And you're going to take care of him because that's in your nature. God created you that way. And so when the woman is loved, she's naturally going to react out of respect. So that's why it's only said twice in here for the woman to take care of things, right? It says submit, and it says uh, respect, because that's the nature. And I begin to share that truth with them, and a, another gentleman comes up to me afterwards. Um, him and his wife have been Sunday school superintendents in their church for years, so on and so forth. He was telling me how they had these big crusades in Milwaukee where hundreds of people come to church and they come, they now, you know, they now adhere to the church and they come and be part of the church after these big crusades, but they don't understand the commitment, he said. They don't understand that they're giving their lives to Jesus. They're just becoming a member of a group of people. And so he, he said it was nice that you explained to the young man and the young lady what their responsibility is as husband and wives. And so I want to go back to that first gentleman. As I go back, I want you to understand one thing. Salvation is found only in Jesus Christ. It's not in church membership. It's not even being here today. I have to be honest with you. It's not even you know signing a membership card or regularly attending church or giving an offering. Those are all great things to do, and we should encourage one another daily. Amen? But your salvation is found in your relationship with Jesus only. Come on. Only. When I, I remember the day, and I'll, I'll close with my, my salvation story. I remember the day Tina had given me her Bible. 
I have it in my office, actually. I still have that Bible. And in the front of that Bible, I was in, I was in jail. I was in the brig at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. I was a Marine. I was thrown in jail, okay? So I was in jail. And as rebel as I was, but anyway, I was, uh, they allowed me to read my Bible. So that's what I did. They, I had other options, but that was military stuff that I wanted to do. And so, um, actually got, uh, the, in the brig, they, they take people out of the brig and they go do working parties across the base. They go pick up trash, they do things, right? And the truck I was in got an accident. A lady from the, the, the post exchange, the PX, the, the, the Walmart, if you will, on base, uh, come flying out in front of the truck. So the truck had to stop and, and all of us in the back are flying forward. And one guy just hit his knee. I, just, I didn't dislocate my thumb, but I jammed it against the wall of the back of the truck. And so at the next day, I couldn't go out on a working party. I just had to sit on my little footlocker by the end of my bed. That's all I, they would let me do. That's why I'd be on light duty, they call it. And so then I began to read. And I asked the, the corporal that was in charge of that door, I said, can I go up to the library? Yes, you can go up to the library. He even passed one, up, one floor to the library. And I was sitting in this chair. And I was reading. I was reading. I was all in Joshua all about the, the, you know, how God did you know, attack them and deliver them. Military God, and this God just showed it to me. And then I remember I closed my Bible, and right in the top, Tina had written this when she was first got saved. So I accepted Christ January 25th, 1975. She had written that in her Bible. She went to youth camp, gave her life to Jesus, her grandma gave her Bible, she wrote that in her Bible. And I don't know why I did it, but I closed that book because I guess I was just pondering my life. Like, my thought at that moment is I was going to just, I was just going to. I was actually going to divorce Tina, and because I wasn't good enough for her, she deserved better. I was just going to come back to Waukesha, Wisconsin, which is just down the road from here, work at Quad Graphics for the rest of my life, and that's just what I, my whole life was. I was just going to, this was what I was going to do. And at that moment, I don't know why I did it, but I, I opened that book up and I looked at that and said, I accepted Christ January 25th, 1975. And I, as a, as a growing up as a Catholic, I, you know, I didn't even heard that before. Um, I never heard accepting Jesus. I don't know what that really meant. But that moment, that little place where I was sitting, it was like I was in a bubble. And God showed up by the power of his presence. It was just amazing. Even today, it's hard to describe how God just showed up in that, that library where I was sitting on that chair. It was just amazing. And he showed me in my mind's eye or in a vision, I can't tell you how that really happened, but I just began to see my life when I was old enough to know better, so whatever age that was, and it showed me all the stuff I did, everything, all the sin, all the, uh, all the stuff I lied, I cheated, the stuff I stole, I mean, just everything. It was, it was, like, it was like, a, like, a, like a movie in front of me, just slowly going by, you know, just slowly, every thing, and I could see myself as I was getting older, you know, and I was only 19 when I got, gave Jesus my life, so I was just, it wasn't a lot of stuff, but it was a lot of stuff. And then at the same moment, as I wrote in the Bible, I said, I accepted Christ January 28, 1980, January 28, 1980, I said February, it was January. It was like God just took an eraser, if you will, like on a whiteboard, just kind of like, like this, right? And it was gone. It was everything. And for the first time, I felt free, whatever that was. I was gone. All the guilt, all the sin, all the disappointment, all the abuses, all the stuff that I went through in my life was gone instantly. And the peace of God filled my heart. And I took a deep breath. It was like I was breathing for the first time. It was amazing. I looked outside the window, it was like the sky was blue and the grass was greener. I never even, it's was, it was like I'd never seen it that way before. It was God had again, that moment I was born again, God changed my life. Changed my life. And just a few years later, I, I got called into the ministry of laying on, a, on the altar, praying out to God because I had all my lost friends and buddies. All the guys that Tina and I used to smoke pot with and party with on Friday night all came to my house and every one of them gave their life to Jesus. I got an opportunity to baptize every one of them in, in, a, in the baptismal at our church. I want them to know Jesus. That's how my heart's been ever since. And I want you to know him. I want you not just to know him through a religious activity. I want you to know him. 
I want just like you when you first accepted Christ as your Lord Savior. That day, whatever that day was, I want that joy and that peace and that just that love to fill you just every day, every morning. Have a born again experience with Jesus. Because in that and only in that will you have that appetite to share with the world. You have to have that love. Because otherwise we just don't. We just we just go about doing our, our Christian whatever life we call it. And we never share Jesus. We have to share. We have to stand up for him. They can take Bibles out of the, the hotels. They can tell our military officers that they can't teach about Jesus. They can do all they want to do to deny Christ, but they, they can't. He's in this country. When uh, the pastor from Togo was here last week, they were so grateful for America, these pastors that live all over the world, that came to the centennial celebration for the Seventh of God down in Springfield, Missouri, from all over the world, uh, Asia, all over uh, Africa, all these pastors were so grateful because we sent missionaries all over the world, they brought the gospel, and they're so happy. They just celebrate. It's a wonderful. Go on ag.org, and you can see the, the the celebration and the preaching and all that stuff. It's on there on the on the on the website. So your pastor's heart today is this: no him, no him. Believe that he is. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Don't let anything compromise that. Young people, that's the truth. This is the truth this morning. There's only one truth. It's through Jesus. Everything pales to Him. Every, every philosopher, every ounce of knowledge is second to the knowledge of Christ. Come on, do you believe that this morning? See, but it's so hard, isn't it? It's so hard to daily get into this thing. It's so hard to spend time, an hour, five minutes in His presence just to get energized so you can do what you have to do. It's hard because the enemy wants to destroy your soul. He wants to bring fear and doubt into your mind and heart. Oh, they're going to make fun of you. They're, they're going to mock you. You might even lose your job over it. Like the one pastor that came and his wife was having surgery at VA. She lost her job because she's a Christian. Lives in Louisiana. Because she had some Christian, uh, they've been in her, in, her, in her office for many years. Christian uh, little sayings and things in her office area. And a new boss said, uh-uh, you're out of here. Why? Because she's a believer in Jesus. That's the only reason she got fired. Stand up, folks. Come on, do that with me now. Stand up. Stand up for him. Uh, let's just bow your hearts and your minds and your head to him right now. And just take a moment, right now, just this morning, this Sunday morning, to say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, I will serve you with all my heart. Give me the joy of my salvation again. Allow me to serve you with all my heart, soul, mind, body, and strength. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe in the healing power. I believe in the gift of the Holy Spirit. I believe that you have me here for a purpose today. Hallelujah. And that purpose, folks, is to glorify Jesus in your life. Hallelujah. Do your job, whatever it is, to the best do it so well that they say, what is that person? Why is she working so hard? Why is he working so hard? And they find out that all the believers in their corporation are the ones that are always working overtime, the ones that do a better job, the ones that, that communicate the best, the ones that, that are serving the best because they're serving Jesus and they're honoring him with their job and their, and their, and their work ethics. Do that. Do that for him. Glorify Jesus in your life. Don't put them second. Put them first. Father, you see every person that's here today, and I thank you for each one of them, Lord God. Father, I pray that each one of them would put you first. First thing in the morning, maybe the last thing before they go to sleep at night. 
Maybe the first conversation they have at work, God, allow them by the power of your Holy Spirit to be your light. Not shining under a bushel, not hiding under a, 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 in a closet, Father, but coming out and sharing the true life and the love that you have for the world. Use these people, Lord. Use everyone, every, the young Father that are here today and the oldest God, that we may glorify you. Hallelujah. And I thank you for them. Bless them. Strengthen them. Give them peace, Father. In Jesus' precious name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Let's give God praise this morning.